Julie, it's nice to have you visit with us. It is our community, you know. Today we have a most interesting guest. Her name is Cheryl Brown Henderson. And Cheryl is the daughter of the Reverend Oliver L. Brown mm -hmm. and the sister of Linda Brown, mm -hmm. who were very, very closely tied to the, I guess it was the country changing case mm -hmm. of Brown versus the Board of Education, mm -hmm. which took place in 1954, which integrated schools. But I think before we get to Brown versus Board, I do have to tell them that you are the founding president of the Brown Foundation mm -hmm. for Educational Equity, Excellence and Research, and the owner of Brown and Associates, which is an educational consulting firm. But I have to say, Cheryl, all these years you have still remained involved in equity, in equal rights for all people, not just of color, whatever color they may be, uh, equal rights, and you have never faltered from that Absolutely. position. So I, I think that it's a particular pleasant to have you with Thank us because the country needs more people Thank that you. stand <laughs> firm, as they say. Um, I think we need to back up a little from 1954 and go to Dred Scott, okay. which really set the stage for all of it. We talk about Dred Scott. Yeah, Dred Scott in 19 or 18, excuse me, 1857, a Supreme Court decision. Uh, the reason it set the stage for what came after, and really a lot of people believe it set the stage for the Civil War, because Dred Scott had been enslaved, traveled with uh, the slaveholder into states that were free. He sued for his freedom. They didn't want to go back into bondage. And, and that was a very gutsy thing to it do. It was very gutsy. <laughs> You're right about that for he and his wife and the yes. family. So ultimately, you know, proceedings in Missouri, there is a national park that interprets his story over in Missouri, part of the arch. Mm -hmm. And Dred Scott didn't succeed, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But the reason it set the stage is because the Supreme Court, in its opinion, announced that African Americans did not have any rights that whites in this country were obligated to respect. So based on that, um, it set the stage for this continuation of bondage, this continuation of slavery, this continuation of African Americans not uh, having any humanity in that regard. So it really was a blow. It was a blow, but it did set the stage. It did. And I think that we, we need to then call attention mm -hmm. to the 14th Amendment, right. which was not taken right. into consideration. Talk about the 14th Amendment. Right, the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, so. Which is before Dred Scott. It was after Dred Scott, before after Plessy. Dred, before Plessy, mm -hmm. okay. So after the Civil War, you know, in 1865 when the war ended, uh, Congress, and I call it the first act of conscience mm -hmm. on the part of Congress, created the Freedmen's Bureau, and then they passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. The 14th Amendment provided citizenship to the formerly enslaved people of African descent. But it also had that little phrase, equal protection of the law. And that's been applied broadly to all of us, not simply African Americans. And then the 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote. No woman had the right to vote until 1920. That, that made us all have our hair stand on Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that became a really, to me that was the, the, the biggest pivot, was the 14th yeah. Amendment. But it should have given everyone equal it protection have. under the law. Yes. And I think often we um, forget mm -hmm. that um, um, de jure is often different from de facto. Exactly. And that's what happened in many cases oh, with absolutely. the 14th Amendment. Let's go to Plessy. I think when we talk about Plessy versus Ferguson, mm -hmm. every education major mm -hmm. talks about Plessy versus Ferguson. But Plessy versus, Ferg versus Ferguson was not an education decision. Yeah. It was a railroad decision. So talk about that just a little bit, because I think it's very well, interesting. Well, it gave the court an opportunity. So even though the reason for the legal challenge was the ability for people of color to ride anywhere, you know, on railroad cars. And uh -huh. basically it was found um, that African Americans would not be permitted that luxury. It gave the court an opportunity to issue forth this edict of separate but equal. That as long as the facilities, whether be they railroad cars or water fountains or public schools, as long as they were equal, then legally they should be kept separate. When intentionally separate was not, you know, supposed to be equal and, and wasn't. 
You know, I'm giving away my age here, <laughs> but I will tell you that when I was a little girl, mm -hmm. I was really little, and yeah. we used to go to Emory Bird's downtown. Okay. And in those days, there were two different drinking fountains. There were two mm -hmm. different restaurants. And so I, in my, in my lifetime, yes. and in, with Plessy, the court had an opportunity to mm -hmm. make things right, yes. and they didn't do it. Absolutely. And Justice Harlan uh, was a, wrote the dissent, and this is what he said. He said, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes mm -hmm. among its citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before mm -hmm. the law. And that was the dissenting mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. that Justin Harlan wrote mm -hmm. um, in Plessy. That was 1896. Mm -hmm. So it was awful slow. It was. Where do we need to go after Plessy? Do we need to talk about, well, let's just quickly talk about mm -hmm. the Margold decision. Mm -hmm. And, and um, because all of these, the Margold plan was mm -hmm. to leave fully uh, untouched the very essence of the existing evils. Mm -hmm. And and there was also the, you know, all of these metastasized, mm -hmm. from Plessy, metastasized into where we really need to start talking to you about Absolutely. Brown people. Yeah, by then the NAACP was uh, coming into its own you know, the NAACP did not begin until 1909. However, the Margot Plan and, and was one of those documents that informed their work. The thing I want to mention, however, is that our state of Kansas was extremely active around this issue. Uh, prior to the NAACP, Kansas had already litigated a half dozen cases about school desegregation yeah. into state Supreme Court. So when the NAACP was formed, and then Kansas, or Topeka, got its first chapter in 1914, um, the NAACP was a very diverse organization. The first president of the Topeka chapter was Arthur Capper, who was a white U.S. senator. And so he it, wrote it a paper, the Capper. Exactly, yeah. exactly. At Capper Foundation. Capper Topeka, Foundation. Right but now, they, did, they didn't, they published a, a regular little newspaper. Capper? Yeah, I, I think know. they did. I think I'm they not did. familiar with their paper. I think they did. Yeah. Uh -huh. but it was very active, so yeah, it would make very, perfect yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason for that statement, though, was to demonstrate how it was people of goodwill, period regardless of their ethnicity or race that had come together mm -hmm. and formed the NAACP. And their, their primary mission was enforcement of the 14th Amendment, the citizenship and the equal protection under the law. So they didn't necessarily start out as an organization that would litigate cases, but they soon found that the best way to gaining these constitutional rights was through the courts. They found that, but they, they, they had two problems, mm -hmm. as I see it. Mm -hmm. One problem was that there wasn't a lot of case law mm -hmm. in segregation mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. and, and what there was often was old. Mm -hmm. That was one problem. Mm -hmm. The second problem was that when they first started trying these cases, they tried them in this state, this state, this state. Mm -hmm. So they were running all over the United mm -hmm. States, trying them state by state by state. Mm -hmm. And Thurgood Marshall, who was the head of the Legal Defense Fund, which was at that time part of the NAACP, said, we cannot do this. We can't afford it. We don't have the staff to do it. So therefore, we have to file a federal case. Well, exactly, in many ways. However, uh, the interesting thing about what ultimately became the um, line in the sand with Brown uh -huh. versus the Board of Education, leading up to that, the state-by-state state cases that you mentioned in Missouri and Oklahoma and Texas mm -hmm. were higher education cases. Yes. Because what they found is that if they could challenge it to higher ed, first of all, it was going to be too expensive for higher ed cases if they had one litigant that wanted to attend a law school that was segregated for whites only. They weren't going to build an entire law school for one litigant. So they realized that higher ed cases gave them the perfect opportunity to, to test this whole equal protection, separate but equal, those kinds of issues. And they were successful at those levels. Charles Houston, who had been the mentor and teacher of Thurgood Marshall and the majority of the legal team, mm -hmm. then in hiring those folks out of Howard Law School, Thurgood Marshall then and some of the young guys convinced him that the public school system, the K-12 system, would be the place to really attack this. Higher education was pretty, pretty cut and dry. But the K-12 system, where there were thousands of students, where there was much more opportunity for uh, challenging the legality of what was being done, would be the way to go to, to finally end the practice of separate but equal and to realize the constitutional protections of the 14th Amendment. It was masterful. Mm 
but they were the ones that encouraged Charles Houston yeah. to make that shift. And so that that national legal team mm -hmm. was 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 sort of an interesting uh, mm -hmm. group of people, right. and. Um, you, you have furnished us a picture of yeah. the national team yes. that we might want to uh, look at and discuss just a okay. little bit. Um, the, the person that we see um, standing in the middle of this mm -hmm. whole long group, mm -hmm. and I have their pictures right here, yeah. there they go, is uh, the man in the middle with his arms crossed is Jack Greenberg. Yes. And you might want to talk about Jack just a little bit. If you would, would you talk about Jack? Yes, you Jack, know Jack Greenberg. When you look at the legal team, again, what was interesting to me, there were uh, diversity on the legal team. Jack Greenberg was the only white attorney on the team. Mm -hmm. Constance Baker Motley, who was not in the photo, was the only woman. Jack Greenberg was also the youngest member of the team, so yes, he's he still still living and still very capable of telling his story. But obviously, he wanted to right out of law school be involved in purposeful law. You know sea changing law, law that was going to take our, our nation into a different direction and boy oh boy did he land in the right place. So he, he ended up being the director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He ended up leading that whole He wrote an effort. interesting book that I think we ought to just make mention of. Mm -hmm. This book was 2002. 2004. 2004. Mm -hmm. And Jack Greenberg was here. Mm -hmm. He wrote this book called Crusaders in the Courts. And if you have any interest at all in it, I think it would be a book that you should um, check out and read. An amazing overview. It is. Through the lens of one of the attorneys. Well, and you know, uh, J Jack spent his whole, he was the youngest and really hadn't mm -hmm. practiced much law, right. but he subsequently spent his whole life in the in the uh, justice justice shalt thou he pursue did. and with the legal defense fund of the yeah, NAACP. He did. Now he did. Thurgood Marshall is another member of mm -hmm. that. He was the first leader of the legal defense fund, mm -hmm. right. and um, he pulled away from the NAACP. Mm -hmm. Why did he do that? Well, I think it was more and more evident that litigation was going to be the, the road to success, and in order to have some autonomy, some independence for fundraising for litigating without um, going through a really burdensome process of approving litigation uh, with non-jurists, for example, it made more sense to have a legal arm so that the NAACP, as we know it out of Baltimore, is the arm that takes care of the more of the social issues and the political issues. NAACP Legal Defense Fund, based in New York, is the arm that continues to litigate cases. And they are separate? Yes. And, and I think probably being separate allows them to be more independent. I with think what? so. I think so. You know, they and to have separate missions. Yeah. And there's a common goal, but separate missions. Exactly, exactly. You know, I think it's, it's appropriate to point out here, too, that part of the reason that the Legal Defense Fund and mm -hmm. the NAACP turned to the courts mm -hmm. was that they had no, no voice mm -hmm. in the national congressional politics. Because in the South, the same white, mm -hmm men, men, mm -hmm. kept getting reelected and reelected and reelected, and they were able to block any congressional effort mm -hmm. to uh, eradicate the separate but equal stance. Yeah, it became clear very early on yeah. that both at the city level, the state level, the federal level in terms of governmental bodies, that they were segregated and they were holding, keeping in place uh, racial segregation. They had no interest in changing that. Uh, there was self-interest as well as political interest. So the courts, because we are a nation, of, well, we practice the rule of law, that law is pretty cut and dry. You know, it says what it says, it can be interpreted, it means what it means. So they found that they had a friend in the courts. And that's, that's you know, but that's what mm -hmm. the courts are for. Exactly. To provide equal justice under exactly. the law. And the Supreme Court, the final mm -hmm. arbiter of the Constitution. Exactly. Um, let's let's talk about the local people okay. that were involved because I think that's probably of more interest to us mm -hmm. here. Um, talk about um, McKinney Burnett. McKinney Burnett was an interesting man. He was the NAACP president from 1948 to 1949. Well, actually, into Browns, I'd say to about 1954, and he was determined. Kansas had an interesting way of managing uh -huh. school segregation. Uh -huh. It had a law that uh -huh. only allowed segregated schools in three cities because they had to be cities of 15,000 or larger, first class cities, they called them. And that so would have been? Wichita, Topeka, and Kansas, Kansas City. Kansas. Uh -huh. And only at the elementary level. So McKinley Burnett, knowing this, 
and it was permitted, not required. Try to just have Topeka Public Schools convince them to exercise their right to integrate their elementary schools. And when he didn't succeed after a couple of years, then he sought out the other people on, on the photo, and the And some of those other people are yes. really kind of interesting. There yes. were John and Charles Scotts, mm -hmm. they were local attorneys. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why and were they chosen? Because they were willing? Because no, they, they were they were the good? Legal Redress Committee for the NAACP. Every okay. branch has what they call a Legal Redress Committee. Okay. So there, even today, branches of the NAACP have attorneys at the ready that work with them on various issues. And those, the Scott brothers they were, were those two? They were, along with Charles Bledsoe, their partner there. And, and it, Lucinda Todd. So it was the Scott the brothers and Charles Bledsoe that practiced together mm -hmm. and represented the Yeah, that represented the uh -huh. litigant. Uh -huh. And Lucinda Todd, if she's in the photo, was the chapter secretary. And she was also the first parent to volunteer to be a plaintiff in Brown v. Board. And then we come to your father, yes. Oliver Brown. Mm -hmm. And there were about 12 plaintiffs. There were 13, 13 families 13, who were uh, plaintiffs. But, uh, but the I, I read someplace, and I don't know, maybe it's the truth, maybe it's not, but that they chose your father. Mm -hmm. He was the only man. He was. And yeah. we believe that, that it was gender, uh -huh. is the reason that he ended up being the, the head of the roster. Was he hesitant? He was hesitant in that it was all women <laughs> and did say to mom that, you know, I'm not sure I want to get involved with all those women, so to speak. <laughs> so that was his, his major hesitancy. Charles and your Scott mother said, a, you just go right There you go. And Charles Scott was a personal friend. Uh -huh. So he actually came to our home and made a personal request that asked dad to get involved, you know, on behalf of, in that case, my sister was the only oldest your child. Your sister Linda. And the only school uh -huh. age child. Now Linda is so, still alive. Yes. Part, most yes. of the plaintiffs are still living. Uh -huh. I mean, we're talking about elementary age kids. Yes, yeah, right. Uh -huh. So they're living. Uh -huh. So basically, Dad then agreed and signed on, and he was about the tenth person um, <laughs> to sign on. And so finally, in the fall of 1950, they had 13 families that said they would be litigants. Uh -huh. And so what people need to realize, your viewing audience, is that these individuals were recruited by the NAACP. It was, an, it was the organization's case, not our case. It was the NAACP's case. So the litigants then were necessary in order to have the documentation and the group to represent. Well, it wouldn't make sense for the NAACP to be the plaintiff. Exactly. So no, I understand. Exactly. Was your father ever afraid? No, uh, Topeka was different than the South uh, because Brown is a, a combination of cases from Delaware, Kansas, Virginia, South mm -hmm. Carolina, right, and right, Washington, right. D.C. Mm -hmm. So unlike the other four cases, Topeka didn't have uh, the kind of strident segregation it wasn't the kind of kept in place by the kind of brutality, so there wasn't. Uh, do you think that had anything to do with choosing Topeka over no, as no, the lead? No one chose Topeka. Topeka chose itself. So it chose itself. Yeah, these these. So cases. they stepped up first. Pardon? The NAACP in Topeka stepped up first to be the. No, lead. No. no. Briggs versus Elliott was the first case to reach the Supreme Court, the South Carolina case. Uh -huh. And you have to remember that there had been 11 earlier cases in Kansas. Right, right. There had been three earlier cases in Topeka. So this was just a continuation. So it was just an evolution of the, exactly, of the process. Right. What did, what did your father, do you remember him talking about it at home? Do you we remember? didn't, no. You didn't? Because no, because again, what people have to realize is when a legal action is really brought by an organization, it's not yours, you know. And so therefore, your role is generally lending your name. So those 13 families uh, really lend, lent their names to this litigation and their actions that were, they were told by the NAACP to locate a white school and try to enroll their kids. So once they did and they followed the, the steps that they were requested to follow, then their job was done, so to speak, um, until they went into court. And some of them did testify. But your father said mm -hmm. that we conclude, it's on the front page of uh, that. Earl Warren. Yeah. But your father made that That was Earl Warren's Right, statement. but he yeah. that was on the uh, Topeka State Journal. Yeah, but the Topeka and State Journal, that is not an attributed quote to him. That's referencing the, the Supreme Court exhibit page. Exactly. 19, 1954. And it says, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities It was a regurgitation of, and then if you read, if you read what it is, it's simply the name of the case. It's not a quote. So Oliver L. Brown et al. versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, is the, is the name of the case. Mm -hmm. So you've got right. the ruling and then the name of the case. So it's mm -hmm. not a quote. It's simply the name of the case. Well, but it's a very important 
Uh, the other thing I do remember mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. there used to be, right where St. Luke's Hospital is at yeah. the plaza, just north of the large St. Luke's Hospital, mm -hmm. where the there's a motel there now. Oh. That was a black school. Oh, I didn't know that. That was, yeah. and that area around that mm -hmm. was um, former slaves who had oh. remained in that area, oh, yes. Yeah. And that little school was, it sat right on top of a little hill. Oh, and so I remember That's that. Interesting. Yeah. So you see, times have changed, but yeah. It's taken them a long time to get there. Well, and the other positive thing, when you mention the, the word slave, the other positive thing is that the present scholarship is finally moved away from some of those pejorative terms, and we reference people during that period as enslaved people. The reason that change has occurred is the realization, the, the inhumane nature of slavery, that referring to people as enslaved people reminds people that this was a system you know, held in place by brute force. It was a system that denied people their humanity. So there are a lot of things, as you said earlier, that have changed progressively in our understanding of history, um, how we speak about history, um, how we educate about history, and it makes a and world of And how we're willing to accept history. Pardon? And how we're willing to accept history. Well, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can't mm -hmm. deny what happened. No. You know, what happened happened, whether you liked it or not, exactly. Well, and even among, I know I, I, I found a quote from um, W.E.B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. and he said, and this was about 1934 mm -hmm. that he said this, and he argued that there was nothing wrong with integration in theory, mm -hmm. but that he opposed mm -hmm. sending black children to white schools mm -hmm. where they would be received with hostility and a lack of mm -hmm. understanding. And that happened. Because it you did look at happen. the first case in the country in Boston, 1849. And the reason, first Boston was integrated, and then African American parents asked that it be segregated because they were meeting with hostility. But what happened, what they didn't realize, was that once segregated, then the public school system would deny the resources so that the African American schools did not have the financial resources that the white schools. So then the Boston parents went back and sued to integrate the public schools. So they went back and forth based on that very quote and what they would confront, the hostility that was there. But you know, it's, it's amazing to me how when people are determined to keep a certain system in place, they'll stop at nothing. So they didn't anticipate that once we had our own schools that they would starve us out, basically, by denying access to the, the financial resources to thrive. So it, it's been interesting to me, the dynamics of it the power. Has. And you know, Cheryl, everything in life is kind of a trade-off. Yeah. And you have to be willing to take that hostility mm -hmm. because the trade-off for that mm -hmm. is much greater, it, it appears to me. And um, Charles Thompson had a, another view. He was the dean of the Howard Graduate School of Education. Mm -hmm. And this is what he said. He said, black children, now this is a change from 1934. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. said, black children should be treated equally only in an integrated system. Black schools did not always educate black children more sympathetically. Members of both races could learn mutual respect only if educated together. Well, and the idea was obviously that we don't live in uh, a world where as you get out of your infancy and, in, and out of your, your schooling where you're just with, you know, in segregated settings. But what they were really after, in my view, schools were the battle Front, but society was the target, the disenfranchisement of people of color. And there was something lost. As you mentioned earlier, there's nothing gained without there being something lost. And so what was lost was that sense of unity, that sense of cohesion, that sense of support that was almost forced when yeah. you were living in segregated settings. What was gained, however, was access to the law, access to opportunity, access to really thrive and, and be who you were intended to be. But what nobody anticipated, those unanticipated consequences, would be how um, people would hang on, you know, to a way of life. They just not want to let it people, go. P change, Mark Twain described it the best. Mm -hmm. He said, change is like riding in a stagecoach. You get keep getting bruised in different spots. <laughs> <laughs> right. And very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right about that. Yeah. It is. It's, it's a... It's an interesting process because you, you wonder, do you mourn what, what was lost or do you take pride in what was gained? 
Well, and let's let's bring that just mm -hmm. a little bit further. Things are changing again because mm -hmm. we are gaining a huge Hispanic right. population, right. Right. and so things are changing. Again. What do you see mm -hmm. uh, as that as that occurs? You've been looking well, at this an awful long time. Historically interesting to me when you consider how our country came to be, and so much of the Southwest was Mexico. Mm -hmm. And we made a bargain mm -hmm. so that that land Good became matter and different. We part of the U yes. exactly part yes. of the U.S. So yes. in my view, we're simply going back to where we were. And as I heard a woman say the other, it was just a masterful statement: is that you know we didn't cross the border; the border crossed us. So basically, people need to accept the fact that the diversity that's around them has always been around them. It's just a fact of how, how the, the numbers. It's a numbers game. Well, it's becoming more and more apparent. I it think is. that's true. And it Barbara is. Jordan, who's one of my very favorite people, uh, Congresswoman from Texas, yeah. uh, said, "You know, we may have come to this country in different boats, but we're all in the same boat." Now. I've used that same statement I myself do all the time. at the end of a speech, and it's very true. It's very true. We're all, all in the same boat, but we don't always recognize it. What, what is in the future for you? What are you doing with yourself? One of the things I'm doing uh, here in the Johnson County area uh -huh. is serving as a coordinator of a coming of age retired senior volunteer program mm -hmm. which has been so much fun. So in addition to speaking about Brown and working on curriculum and making sure that that history is told in classrooms then I get to work with people 50 plus uh, my age group in planning for their future and so we do workshops around that. We've had some at Johnson County Community College so between Brown v. Board and planning for the future and, and uh, plugging volunteers in that are 50 plus, it's an immensely busy time. But you know, I want to pull out a thread here. What's that? 50 plus looking toward their future. Yes. See, and that's the whole thing. Yes. I think that so often mm -hmm. uh, as we age, we think, oh, this is the end. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. And mm -hmm. that's just not true. Not anymore. People live another 40, 50 years, you know, beyond the age 50. We can still so. go down the yellow brick road. We can. We <laughs> certainly can. <laughs> And I, I have to say that at great moments in our history, America has shown that it can muster the will and the strength to change. It can. Mm -hmm. It must do so again in this generation to come. Absolutely. And for we should seek justice for its own sake. Those for whom that is no reason enough should understand that without justice there shall be no peace. Beautiful. Thank you, Cheryl yeah, Brown Henderson, you. for talking about a large part of our history and a large part of our future. Yes. And thank you. It's always such a pleasure to have you. It's our community you know. I'm Mary Davidson and we'll see you soon again.